Hi, and welcome to the Do Something Indie Show. I've been looking forward to this one. We have Gary Barbel live here on the Do Something Indie Show. I know this has been like marked on his calendar, like, let's go. <laughs> and uh, Gary, I don't know if you noticed, I put the uh, like 1980s, the feathered bangs in there. I saw yeah, that yeah. picture, got it off of your website. I'm like, yeah, I had curly hair and uh, I, my <laughs> sister would, I have a, a younger sister, she would make it straight every morning for yeah. me before school so you know because straight hair was cool back then you didn't want to have curly hair so so gary how are you doing this evening i'm doing good let's do something all right oh i well, like with your show this is this is this is going to be fun so uh if if you're uh, tuning in we we've got the comments open here for you to to ask any questions you want to ask uh, but we're going to get started we're going to ask uh, gary some personal stuff here and see uh get to know him because i know most of you know him for his cartoons, and uh, they're very, very good. And uh, so, uh, Gary, let's see what uh, what can we have interesting. Let's start out with this one. What's a fun fact that maybe nobody knows about you? Uh, well, a fun fact that I, I will say it this way: a fun fact that not very many people know about me is I uh, play men's fast pitch softball and have since 1980, and. Okay. Uh, my the league I was in uh, didn't play last year because of COVID. It was the first time in forty years that we didn't play. But other than that, so it's a game that you know it's pretty popular with the girls' game. But the men's game is at one time back in the fifties was really popular. But now it's been kind of uh, slowly dissipating. Not as many teams, not as many guys play men's fast pitch softball. Yeah. Do you remember the king and his court? Yes, I did, I, and I saw him play. I didn't. I didn't play against him, but I saw him play. Yes. Yeah. The uh, my friend that lived across the street, his dad was uh, played that in that league or yeah. that game. So, what position do you play? I play third base, and I uh, I've actually played all the positions, but mostly I played third base throughout my playing career. And then I, you know, I pitched a few times when uh, when we didn't have a pitcher. So I'm I know enough on how to pitch to be dangerous. Uh, I can hit a few people. But, yeah, I was gonna uh, say how many people did you but hit? But right, yeah. But right now, you know, uh, uh, the team that I that I've had for a long time. Uh, my my oldest son is the the lead pitcher. He's really good. Okay, cool. So that's a family tradition a little bit. Okay, so yeah, it is. In uh, fact, our, in fact, in fact, our team is called Legacy because we have a legacy of playing the game and also a legacy of, of following Christ. All right, cool. So this is like a, a bowling league with uh, bats and balls instead of, of that type sure. of thing. <laughs> yeah, <I can laughs> There's that a, well, then you live out in Brownsburg. Uh, so yeah. the, they're just trying to build a new little league thing out there that seems to be catching a lot of uh, interest with some people, uh, expensive and all that. Is is that where you guys would play or is that? No, uh, we wouldn't play there. No, there's only one place. Hit them over the fence easy. Yeah, no, the, the uh, no, we don't usually play on in, in on fields like that. I mean, we play at a place in Lawrence. Um, there's very few places that will allow men's fast pitch to play. I'm not sure why, but there's just very few places that we could ever play. Um, though, no, the uh, the I think the big concern uh, about the uh, diamonds out here in Brownsburg is the cost. Now they say it's not going to cost taxpayer money, but I don't know where the money's coming from. Yeah, and coming again, from I don't know enough about that to be from. dangerous. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, that's uh, well. It's interesting how people, uh, how politicians have can spend somebody else's money real quick, like, and you know, that's Easy. okay. Let's put a couple of zeros behind it and go. Okay, here's another. Here's another really yeah. interesting question. What's your favorite color? Black. Black. Okay. Why is that? It just always has been. I've always liked black. And I think maybe early in my career, all my cartoons were in black and white. You know, I just used black ink. But I don't know. Black has a dynamic uh, look to it. Um, I'm wearing kind of a teal blue tonight. But uh, I have black. I have a black baseball shirt yeah, on, yeah. actually. Well, black's got all the colors in it. So I think yeah, that's a very inclusive answer you gave there. Sure. Uh Okay, what uh, what kind of hobbies? I mean, obviously, softball's part of your hobby. Do you go any other stuff? Fishing, golf. What what kind of things you do uh, uh, other than that? Drawing and whatnot. Is there any like you when I was school? younger? I used to play a lot of basketball. I enjoyed playing ball. 
Now, um, I think I like I like making movies with my kids, and uh, we at one time had a uh, well, we still have a YouTube channel called Varvel Insider, and uh, and so my oldest son is the he's the executive director of House of Grace Films, and he lives in Plainfield, and he makes movies, and I get to work with him doing that kind of stuff. And that's a lot of fun. And my youngest son is a filmmaker as well. And he works for IU medical right now. He does training films for them, but he's previously was with channel four and also channel eight, no six channel six. And yeah. so he did, he did TV commercials for them. And both of my sons are Emmy award winners, by the way. Okay. Yeah. I've had a uh, 15 year, uh, 15 Emmy award winning fraternity brother of mine on. And then Andrea Moore has been on, I think she's only seven Emmys. So I was joking yeah. with my, with Bill. I said, can you get me someone <laughs> with 30 Emmys? And he goes, yeah, I can. <laughs> like, so, but that's cool. So they're, they're, uh, taking advantage of, uh, their creative genes then. Uh, yes. what, uh, I got a, we got a question from Vern Nelson here. I don't know what movie he's talking about. When's the movie premiere? You got something coming up on this? Well, I, there was uh, my son was the lead. Brett was the lead in the Mar um, in the Mayberry Man movie, which was shot in Danville. A lot of it was shot in Danville. Some of it in Indianapolis as well, and also in North Carolina. But uh, I don't know when the movie premiere is going to be yet. I, I think they're still working on a distribution model. And once they do that, then they'll have a premiere. I don't know, but I do have a part in that movie. I play the mayor of Mayberry. <laughs> You'd be perfect for that. You ought to run for the mayor. Oh, yeah. You could do your own cartoons. Yeah, you could you could do your own cartoons and win for sure. <laughs> just, yeah, that's right. The guys look bad. And you look great. It's like it's what a easy. what a great idea. <laughs> yeah, really. Why? Why? Yeah, that is good. Uh, okay, so uh, as far as uh, you know the uh, the drawing, let's talk about that a little bit. How you got involved with that? Uh, did you go to school for art somewhere, or is this something that you? Yeah, just I went to I went to John Heron School of Art for a, co a couple of years, but you know, not to study cartooning because that's not what that school's about. I mean, I was studying uh, visual communications, and um, but I didn't finish there. I left and I got a job working for a weekly newspaper in Brownsburg, so to speak. It just so happens. And that paper was only in operation for a year. It's called the County Courier. And it went out of uh, it folded after one year. And I was out of we I was out of work for a couple of weeks. And then I got a job working at the Indianapolis News, where I spent the next 16 years. Um, and to take you all the way back where I first got interested in it, I was 12 years old when I saw a mad magazine in uh, a little five and dime store in Danville called Danner's. I don't know if some people remember Danner's oh. department store. Uh, I, but I saw a mad magazine there and I fell in love with uh, the cartoons. And, and so I, that started a, a habit of buying uh, the, the magazine and then just practicing on my own, just drawing it in my free time. Now I, when I was young, I, you know, wanted to be a, professional basketball player, you know, like mo a lot of kids are that way, you know, what? and I, but I didn't have the athletic gifts for that, but drawing was something I could do. And uh, when I was 17, uh, I met Jerry Barnett, who was the editorial cartoonist at the Indianapolis news. And when I saw what he did for a living and he was so encouraging to me. And that's when I, that's really when I thought, okay, this is a possibility. He told me, he says, you're good enough to do this for, uh, for a living if you really work hard at it. I think it can happen. But, you know, in 1974, John, there was only two, there was 200 jobs for editorial cartoonists in the country. 200. Wow. Now, today, now that's not very many, but today there's, there's got to be about 15 or less full-time editorial cartoonist jobs. Um, there's very few people are still doing it now there's a lot of people who draw cartoons like me but they're syndicated so their work is appearing in newspapers but they don't have a home newspaper that pays all the bills for them and so i've been syndicated through creator syndicate since 2001 and so my cartoons appear in over 100 newspapers around the country um i don't know how much you want me to tell about this but you know uh, just recently uh mallard fillmore that cartoon, that's a comic strip, and it's a conservative comic strip. 
and where I draw editorial cartoons, I don't do comics, but uh, he, uh, his cartoons were canceled by Gannett. So he lost, I think, 69 newspapers in one day. They're all gone because the corporate uh, office at Gannett told all the, their newspapers, and, and Gannett's the largest newspaper change, chain. Uh, they own uh, like 250-some newspapers, I think. And anyway, uh, so he lost a lot of newspapers at one time. And like the following week, I lost 14. It wasn't from Gannett, though. It wasn't from Gannett. It was another chain. I won't say who they were. Uh, it was a smaller chain, but it was a bunch of smaller newspapers. But some of those newspapers, I had been in there for 20 years. and But they were told by the bosses upstairs that, you know, we're not running him anymore. And, 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 I, and here is the issue, John. I'm too conservative. They thought I was too radical. And they wanted me to moderate my tone. If I moderate my tone, then maybe they might give me another chance. Look, I am who I am. I draw from a biblical worldview as best I can, but I see the world from a conservative viewpoint, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna moderate. I'm not gonna change the way I see things uh, just to please somebody. And even if it even if I lose some some newspapers, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, and I I do appreciate a man with principles, and you know it seems like a lot of folks go where the wind blows, go along to get along. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that your, your stuff is done with class. So, I mean, there's, Thank some, you. I, I could, I could say, uh, there's other stuff that's not so, <laughs> that's not so classy that's out there these days. And mm -hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a dying art to be, uh, to, to make things interesting. And I'm impressed at how fast you can get something out. So let's let's talk about the technique a little bit. So when you started, it was pretty much pencil and paper, right? Yeah, it was. And and uh, I think there are very few guys that still do it that way. And it was about uh, 2001 or two when I was told that we need I, I, that I'm supposed to do my cartoons in color. So up to that point, I was just drawing black and white. When I was with the Indianapolis News, we would do some color from time to time, but it was the old way. And I don't want to try to go into all the details that would bore people, but I mean, it was laborious to try to do color. And I was guessing a lot of times because I was blocking in areas and then, and I would tell them what percentage of colors that I want in that. But nowadays, you know, I, it, a lot of people would do it in Photoshop. And so I would draw the cartoon on a uh, Bristol board. It was a stiff paper. And in it, and then ink it in, and I you would use a brush, dipping it in into the ink. I mean, well, this is old school. And then I would scan it into the computer and then color it in, in Photoshop. Did that for years until 2017. And I had, you know, I'd been seeing some guys uh, who were doing work digitally. They were drawing their cartoons digitally. So there's no, there's no original anymore. And so in January 2017, I bought an iPad Pro. And then I started drawing all of my cartoons that way. And then after about two months, then I, uh, I posted on, on Facebook and kind of announced to everybody that I was doing my cartoons digitally and I was using iPad pro and everything. And so, uh, and I'm using the app procreate. If people are interested in that, you can go get it. And it's really cheap. It doesn't cost very much, but, uh, I had some people say, has, have you noticed a change in your style? You know, because you're doing it on on a basically a computer instead of drawing on paper, and I had to ask them, "Have you noticed a difference?" Because I've been doing it this way for two months, and nobody even noticed. Okay, so the the you know whatever style is it, that's coming out of your head, and and uh, and you know working with your hand. Um, anyway, you, you, uh, your wife says it, it procreates ama amazing. It is there amazing. You know, yeah. She she's got another question for you. I don't know if you remember this guy from yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Chip Otty. Chip Otty used to be in my Sunday school class. I taught it and it was a young married Sunday school class, and I taught it for a long time. We all got old together, <laughs> but uh, but uh, Chip and his wife Becky are they're great, and uh, they they were a huge help to me when they when I was in the class. They used to do our our, our class program and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's cool. It's you know, and and I think that uh, you know we both have the gray hair and what and whatnot. It's yep. it's uh, 
I think it's really cool to look back <clears throat> over our lives of the relationships and different things. And I'm a Mason contractor and I drive around mm -hmm. the town and I see all these buildings that I lay the bricks on. And I That's was at cool. a meeting with a guy, with some people. And after the meeting, he said, I'm from Greenwood. I, I jokingly said, I probably bricked your house. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> did you really? <laughs> yeah, it That's was cool. You know, it, 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 so I, you know, I call it the, uh, I think we're in the fall of our lives maybe. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the stories that I hear you talk about are the memories that we have and, you know, just going through that and the people that we've got to know over the years mm -hmm. and uh, how many, do you have an estimate of how many cartoons you've drawn? Well, I estimated when I left the star that I had drawn 8,000 cartoons. Um, and it's, you know, I didn't go and count every one of them, but estimating how many, you know, counting in vacation time and days off. And, uh, and I, I, that's what I came up with. Um, and that sounds about right. You know, I've drawn a lot more than that, but, uh, some of the stuff, you know, does, it goes in the trash. I was, when I used to teach, I used to teach an art class at, uh, Bethesda Christian school. I taught there for 14 years part time. And I used to tell the students, you know, half of the stuff I draw goes in the trash you know, don't be afraid of making mistakes and then just, you know, get rid of it. Don't get married to the thing. You got to draw another one the next day. And that's the way that business is. And you, you just crank them out. A lot of times people will say, Hey, I love the cartoon you did last week. And I don't remember draw, drawing it. And I, oh, this is always one of my favorites too. People come up and say, Oh, I, my favorite cartoon that you draw that you ever drew. And they'll start to describing it. And I, I didn't draw that cartoon. I just let them go though. Thank you. I'm glad you liked that one. But I didn't draw it. Yeah, that's great. Taking that credit. Yeah, that's uh, that's always a good one. Uh, so let's see. So you uh, you know you talk about your Christian uh, background and 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 belief and all that, and you know you do you're able to get away with putting that in your your trade. Uh, you know, say. You know, there's a lot of places where you start talking about religion and, and people's eyes will glaze over. Uh, I, I like how you are able to put that in. And there's a saying I have, uh, you don't have to, telling somebody you're a Christian doesn't really work. Why don't you just show them? So they, they should know you're a Christian without you having to tell them. Uh, you know, I run into a lot of folks that will tell you they're a Christian and they don't. That's like, what's that famous saying of Gandhi? I like your, your Christ, but you Christians are so unlike him. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I do appreciate that. But how did you, uh, how did you make that decision to, to go that route? I mean, was it just something just, you just did it and they put up with it or did you have to work it in or how, how walk me through that a little bit. Um, okay. So I, it, first of all, it's who I am. Uh, I, I haven't always been a, you know, as a uh, faithful follower as I should have been when I was younger. I mean, it took me a while to, you know, to figure this out. You know, you kind of grow uh, maturing spiritually. But I, I recognized a long time ago that I have a particular gift. God's given me a, a, an, an interesting gift uh, to be able to see the world the way I do and to draw. And I wanted to commit my life to doing that for him, to being his voice. Now, he opened up the doors for me to, to work a job working for a secular newspaper. And, you know, they don't hire you and your job is not to be a, an evangelist. Uh, but I have a biblical worldview because I read the Bible every day. So I'm reading the Bible. And so now when I see the world, I see what, you know, what the Bible's already described the world was going to be like. So, um, so it just comes out in my cartoon. So it's the way I think now, right? Uh, but evangelizing is still part of it. Being silent isn't, isn't a solution. That's right. I don't know where we ever got to the point um, where Christians uh, have be become afraid. But, you know, I think about what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So he's not ashamed, which means that a lot of people who are Christians are ashamed. And I think that uh, we've allowed this culture to cancel people, and it's not going to stop. Um, and so I have decided to just, uh, I'm just going to be who I am. And if you don't like it, you know, it used to be, John, 
the liberal point of view is that they would say, if you don't like it, just turn the channel or just turn it off or turn the page. Well, now they don't allow you to do that. Now, if they don't like it, now they, they want to cancel you. They want you to lose your job. They don't want you to be able to make a living anymore. And uh, that's to me, that is insane. And I'm not going to stand for it. I don't think anybody else should. So I'm done apologizing. You know, here's an interesting thing, John. Jesus never apologized because he never no. said anything wrong. But you he know, said some hard things. He, had, he, he addressed the culture this way. He was speaking to the Pharisees one time, and he said to them, you are of your father, the devil. Now, that's some strong words, yeah. <laughs> but he, he was exactly right. He said, because the devil has been a murderer from the beginning. Well, what did those guys do? They had Jesus murdered. Yeah, that's so one he thing. he was absolutely that, right. It's one thing to uh, have somebody accuse you of something, but then they go and prove it. And he called them brood of vipers. And, you know, we're in Holy Week. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, it, he's turning over tables. He's, you know, he rides into town a hero and, and yeah. they think he's going to do all that. And, you know, in one week he gets these people so irritated that they're, you know, they're done with him. And, you know, it's, it's all part of the big plan. And I, you know, I just would say, you know, folks should read the Bible. You know, the Bible is the most published book in the history of the world by mm -hmm. five times more than all of the books put together. It's unbelievable how much the Bible's been written. And, uh, Yet you can't use it as a as really anything in any kind of research or anything else. So excuse me, I'm well. I'm I'm going to use it for research. I tell you what, uh, Ronald Reagan said that uh, there is not a problem that man has that the solution is not found in the pages of the Bible, and that Fine. I believe that absolutely true. If we and the problem with America today and the reason we have so many problems that we're dealing with is uh, I'm reminded of Solzhenitsyn and he was talking about when he was a young man and they, and Russia was having so many problems and, you know, dealing with communism and everything else. And he remembered hearing a couple of older men talking and they said, the reason this has happened to Russia is because we are a nation who has forgotten God. Now, those were Russians who were saying it. I would say that that is probably the majority of the problem in America today. Yeah, I think that we rely on ourselves and uh, to, to take right. care of if we rely on our government. There's a, a, a guy that uh, that I listened to, John Deal. He's an attorney, and uh, he said that same very thing. Anything you need to find in the Bible, you can do that. He, he said a church called to write the bylaws for for he wanted to write the bylaws. He said, hold on a second. You already got the bylaws. Just read the Bible, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, uh, it, and his suggestion was to read the Bible through, just read it through quickly and then go back. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that was really helpful to me because I studied the Bible, you know, kids, you hear the stories and all that, but to, to go through and, and to study it and to actually, you know, and obviously being older, I, I joke around. Ecclesiastes is great to read when you're younger, but reading it when you're 50 sort of explains a few things <laughs> to you about. Yeah, it does. It's a wake up call. So, uh, which, which, by the way, John, uh, Ecclesiastes 10.2 says the wise man leans to the right and the fool leans to the left. So uh, I call my book a drawing the right way. And uh and I and so I would encourage people to go to GaryVarvel.com, go to my store page, and you can buy my book. And I inside my book, I explain in, inside my book, I explain a lot about uh, my viewpoint. I talk about a little bit about my Christianity and um, and what I see as my duty now. And I also encourage people to take uh, my newsletter. You can sign up for my newsletter at GaryVarvel.com, and uh, so you'll get. If there's a free version and then there's a pay version, and then I also have membership. If people want to join uh, my membership, you get some extra benefits as well. But uh, even the free version, you will see um, I, I write a little short column every week about uh, what I see is going on in the world. And from a biblical standpoint, I usually include a Bible verse, and then I explain uh, what was happening then. Here's an interesting thing, John. People don't change. Every generation, you know, we have technology today, but people are the same. I just did a Bible study with John Branion. We went through the book of Acts and we have this online Bible study. And um, 
one of the things we noticed is every time Paul would go into a city, he would get run out by a mob. You know, he, he'd go in and he would, he would win some people to Christ, but then the mob would get stirred up and then they would go after him. And my favorite, my favorite text, I think it's, I think it's uh, Acts chapter 19. Anyway, it says this. It says that many of the people in the crowd didn't know why they were there. And I think that's the general <laughs> definition of most mobs. Most of the people don't even know why they're there. You know, it's like, oh, well, we're stealing TVs from Target. Let's go, you know, let's go get some stuff. Yeah, they show up because there's a big angry mob and then they just kind of mix in. But I don't think anybody, you know, we watched all those riots during the summer and it's just people acting in uh, from their sinful nature. It's just, it's, that's their nature and they're acting from it. Yeah, I believe it's Proverbs 30 uh, that says locusts advance in rank, ranks, yet they have no king. So, yes. you know, they, there's <laughs> yeah. nobody, in, they just, they destroy and, and nobody really knows who's leading the thing. And it really, that's right. It's all, it's all there. And I, I you know, I do a Proverbs group on uh, online uh, on Facebook, done it for 12 years, uh, three months before good Friday, which is in a couple of days, I, I start, I could count backwards and we do a book of Proverbs every day. Uh, and, uh, oh, cool. you know, so, we're, and it ends on good Friday and I would, think I should know it a lot better after 12 years, but you know, some days I post it and I don't even have time for myself to read it. Mm -hmm. uh, but this last uh, month, there's a, a, a Mason, I'm a Mason contractor and my supplier, uh, Bruce Tannenbaum, uh, he said, well, why don't we do uh, the last month? Let's do the, uh, uh, the uh, Jewish version and the, and the English version together. And, you know, and you can see the, the Hebrew on there. So I thought that was cool, but you know what? Bruce died six weeks ago, 52 years really? old of a heart attack. Oh and my. I'm like, it was just crazy. I said, but Bruce, we didn't even get to do your month for Proverbs. So, yeah. uh, but 3000 years old. And just like you said, same mistakes people make. And if you yeah. read from Solomon to the 10 generations after that, they just keep doing worse and worse. And pretty soon mm -hmm. they're, they're uh, in exile. You got, you know, uh, got lost, lost everything. So I don't know why people don't see that. I mean, obviously they don't believe, but uh, I don't. They see don't believe it because they haven't even they haven't studied it. They haven't read it. Uh, it. The reason I believe in the Bible is there's a whole bunch of reasons. Fulfilled prophecy is one. There's no other book that predicts the future and then it happens. And I'll give you one amazing prophecy that's been fulfilled uh, in the last century. Uh, and that was uh, Exodus chapter 36 and 37, not Exodus, Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. And it says there that uh, the, the Jewish people would be scattered throughout the four, cor four corners of the world. And then in the last days, they would be brought back to their, whole, their own land and their language would be restored. And in 1948, the Jews were given the, the rights to their uh, homeland again. They started going back. And today they speak Hebrew there. Now, yep. that has never happened before. There's no, I don't know where the Chaldeans are, but they're not around anywhere. The Bible talks a lot about the, them. There's a lot of different people groups, but you don't see that ever happen where they go out of out of being a nation for that period of time, a long period of time, and then they come back. But it was prophesied that that, that would happen. Uh, the prophecies about Jesus are incredible. Not, o not only the ones that he fu fulfilled, but also the ones that people fulfilled beside him. Uh, if you read Psalm 22, for instance, is amazing. And Isaiah 53, I mean, it's just a picture of the crucifixion of Christ. And it also says that he will rise again. So there, there's so many reasons that why I would believe uh, the Bible. If people were to read it, it would change them. And the people who have tried to prove it wrong, guys like uh, Lee Strobel, for instance, uh, who wrote the, <laughs> yeah. the book A Case for Christ. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it backfired on him because he was trying to prove the Bible wrong and and got convinced it was true. And now he's a Christian leader, writes books about it. Uh, so, yeah, it's a fantastic book and. It's life-changing if people would just read it. 
it is the greatest. It's just the greatest story. It's got everything in it, and that you'd want to have. And uh, who's the who's the guy that was in the fifties? I can't believe I can't think of his name. That uh, it's a, bi- a big apologist. Uh, I I've lost. I, I, this is terrible. I can't think of that. In the fifties? Yeah, fifties mm-hmm. yeah. and sixties. Uh, uh, I can't. Uh, it'll come to me later. We'll we'll go. <laughs> we'll, okay. we'll, we'll come back hey, to that. Uh, you know, real quick, a story about a cartoonist. Uh, I was inspired years and years ago by Vaughn Shoemaker, and I never knew the man. He, he lived back in the 30s, but he won a Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. He worked for, I think it was the Chicago Sun before it became the Sun-Times. Uh, don't quote me on that, but but here's the story. He was a Christian guy, came to Christmas time, and he drew a cartoon of a manger scene, black sky with ju- just the words from John 3.16 in the sky, for God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And he turned it into his editor, and his editor said, you know, not everyone's Christian. You know, and our readers, you know, there might be some people who will be offended by this. And uh, Von Schumacher said, this is what Christmas is. It's not Santa Claus. It's the birth of Christ. And so they ended up, uh, the publisher, uh, they called him in on to make the final decision. And the publisher said, yeah, Vaughn's right. I mean, that's what Christmas is. Go ahead and run it and see what happens. Their concern was that they would get a lot of negative mail. Well, they ran the cartoon and they, the following week, they got a whole bunch of mail, but it was all positive. They, everybody loved the cartoon that he was bold enough to say, what well, that's what Christmas is right there on the editorial page. It became so popular that they reran the cartoon every year. And uh, I was inspired by that story to, you know, take the opportunity of a Christian holiday and not say it's, you know, just a holiday or a winter holiday or whatever, but to say this is Christmas or Easter, for instance, you know, Easter's coming up. In fact, I'm gonna, tonight going to work on an, on an Easter cartoon. Um, but to be bold enough to say what it is, and I think that the Lord blesses that. And I, so I have done a whole bunch of Christmas cartoons over years. In fact, I've turned them into Christmas cards and uh, some of them. And if you go to GaryVarl.com, you can see them there. <laughs> I keep yeah, plugging I, my site, don't I? No, no, you should, you need to go there because you, there is tons of cartoons on there. It's, it's really cool. Uh, so uh, here, here's a, uh, here, uh, yeah, here's some fan club. This, this guy yeah, right here. Hey. Is that the Doug Doug Wilson that used to work at the Star? Is there a Doug? I think I, there was a Doug Wilson worked at the Star years ago. Now, this this guy, he's a he's a brick sale. He was a brick salesman. I met him like almost thirty oh, okay. years ago. So he's not the same he's guy. In, okay. uh, he's in a band. He's a drummer for RPM uh, forty five RPM, and they really? do British Invasion stuff, and they're really good. But cool. as you were, we were talking earlier, COVID sort of killed all that stuff off, and uh, yeah, to get him to come on Facebook to watch you. Nice. You got a fan there. You got a fan. Yeah, that's, so that's fun. Uh, Thanks well, for coming along, one, Doug. He's uh, here's one for you, Schultz. Uh, you know, Peanuts cartoon. Uh, yeah. What's your take on the Great Pumpkin? Is, is that? To, uh, let me hear me out on this one. I think that that's sort of one of those things where uh, people that are believe in Jesus that are waiting for Him to come back. Or or am I just like crazy (laughs) about that when Linus is in the pumpkin patch? That's interesting. I don't know. I I had never, I had never made that connection before. Um, It it is interesting that, that he picks Linus to be the kid who does it. And Linus's faith obviously drives him, you know, especially from the, that uh, Christmas movie, you saw that. And, and, and I think Linus is the one who quotes scripture more than anybody else in that comic strip. I don't even know if anybody else quotes it, but he did many times. Um, so I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know Charles Schultz, but I admired his work. I mean, his simplistic line and the characters that he, you know, any, any strip that's successful has to be driven by characters. But, you know, the comics page is different than the editorial page, editorial cartoonist, uh, we don't, our, our main job is not to make you laugh. Our, our main job is to make you think. And, and then we're talking about real things that are happening and we do exaggerate. Oh, get this, get this, John. Uh, last week I had one of my cartoons fact checked by PolitiFact and it was, uh, it was checked as partly false. And I thought, <laughs> you gotta be kidding. 
you know, they did contact me by email and I didn't respond because I wanted them to actually, I wanted them to fact check me. I wanted them to put a label on my cartoon because I thought, you know, you could do that with every cartoon I draw. And so I started doing that <clears throat> after that. So I did a cartoon of, um, of, you know, when, when Biden fell up the steps. So I did a cartoon of the steps close up, but I showed banana peels on the steps and the banana peel was labeled China. One of them was labeled Russia. One of them was labeled the border crisis. And so then I fact checked. I said, I want to fact check my cartoon before PolitiFact sees it. And then I went on and said that uh, according to major news sources and my own eyes, there were no banana peels actually on the steps. And if there were, they weren't really labeled China, Russia, and border crisis. I just wanted to make that clear in case anybody was confused. But, you know, you could hear, hear I mean, it's almost like the, them fact checking Babylon B. It's satire. We are, we are stretching the truth, we are, but we're trying to make a point. You know, so we're exaggerating, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, when I'm doing drawings. You know, what, one of the things that, that cartoonists do is we try to visualize in a humorous way if we can. Some things are not funny, okay? Um, and so I just posted my cartoon today about uh, Joe Biden's $2 trillion infrastructure bill. And I, you know, that ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal and it was sideways. So I drew that kind of ship with this, you know, he, all this, you know, stuff on top of it. And uh, it's stuck. And I, I have the, uh, the canal really small and so this hu huge ship. But there's a rope coming off the front of the ship and two little children are the next. It's the, they are labeled the future. They're supposed to pull this ship out. And that's what we're doing. We're paying, you know, we're spending $2 trillion on infrastructure and expect the next generation to pay for it. And we keep doing that. And I know people will say, well, where were you, you know, when Trump was in there and he spent $8 trillion more? You know, I know. And I did some cartoons about that. Uh, but, it, in, you know, he wasn't, well, I'm not going to defend Trump. Look, the <laughs> thing is, this administration, since they've come in, have really started moving the needle in the wrong direction. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an effect. You know, and the next thing he wants to do is he wants to start taxing corporations. That's a way to keep them here. Also, do you don't think that's going to be a tax on the, the middle, middle class? Because they're just going to pass the cost on down to us. Yeah, I mean, you're a businessman, John. You know what happens when your costs go up. You have to pass it along. Yeah, and it's and the inflation is going big time. I mean, lumber right now and, you know, my block price has gone up, concrete. It just... I, I can't hardly chase it fast enough right now uh, and it'll stabilize. Uh, so here's a, here's another point for you. So what other comic strip person personality or uh, is your favorite other than yourself? I mean, I, if you don't like yourself, okay, my, be my, uh, my, I'll say, uh, first I'll start with comic strip. The greatest, in my opinion, the greatest comic strip cartoonist in my lifetime was Bill Watterson. Uh, hands down to me, the best the best draftsman, the be just humorous. Uh, he drew Calvin and Hobbes. And I think that, that, you know, he only did it for 10 years and then he walked away from it. I it just, I, it's, it's hard to believe that he would just say, okay, I'm done. But it was just, to me, it was sheer genius every day. Um, and I loved it. I always look forward to seeing it. I have several of his books of uh, cartoons. Um, so I think he was the best. Editorial cartoonist, probably in my business, probably Jeff McNally, all-time greatest cartoonist in my opinion, three-time Pulitzer winner, uh, conservative, uh, but not angry about it, you know, if you know <laughs> what I mean. Yeah. Well, uh, he had that great, uh, he had a great sense of humor, his drawings were just beautiful, and he, he inspired, I think, uh, this whole generation of cartoonists my age and younger. Um, and I got to meet him one time and what a gracious guy he was. Terrific. He died in 2000 of uh, colon cancer, but, uh, so I didn't know him well, but, um, so I, I was a huge admirer of him and today, you know, uh, working cartoonist, uh, I'm good friends with Michael Ramirez and he and I talk every once in a while. And I think he's, I think he's a genius as well. 
I mean, I was going to ask if you guys have like, a, you know, they have the Oscars and the Emmys and all that. Do they have like a oh, yeah. time when yeah. you all get together and, and like, oh, my, you know, my. Here, yeah. Here my <laughs> you know, and I've gone to a few of those. Uh, the National Cartoonist Society is the largest one, the NCS, and they have a Rubin Awards. Uh, and it, they literally do it black tie. You know, so people come in tuxes and if you're nominated and they do the, you know, they have like three, each category, they have three nominations and then they announce the winner at the, uh, at the, the convention. And so I won one year, uh, 2011, uh, and I won for best editorial cartoonist. And that was, uh, quite an experience. It was, it was a, a fun time and yeah, it's, it's fun seeing these names that you've, uh, you've seen on the paper for a long time. I got my picture taken with a couple of the mad magazine cartoonists. So that was kind of a treat for me. Yeah. The mad magazine. I remember that growing up and yeah, that was all good. So what's your most coveted award that you've won or uh, what's, what's probably your, your coolest thing you really felt like, dang, I'm, I'm somebody now I won this one. Well, I don't think I, I, I never think You're somebody. I'm somebody. Come on. Don't, I don't, don't, be, don't be giving so me that I, I tell you what, the, the coolest uh, trophy I ever got was the Robert F. Kennedy Award for editorial cartooning. Uh, and um, I'll tell you a quick story about that. But it is a bust. It's 16. It's like this big. It's 16 pounds. And it's a bust of Robert F. Kennedy. And uh, cool. it's really cool looking. And it's heavy. And. Anyway, um, so I entered it. I asked my boss uh, about entering it in 2010, and he said, nah, that always goes to a liberal cartoonist. You're not going to win that one. But that year I drew cartoon. I did a cartoon. Uh, I did a graphic novel series called Path to Hope, and it was about childhood poverty. And I thought this might have a chance. So that was part of my entry. Anyway, I entered it, and... I was, I'll never forget this. I was uh, in the office. I'm talking to my editor, and I hear my phone ringing in in my other office, in my office in the next room. But I thought, oh, the voicemail will get it. And so when I got done talking to my editor, I go, I answer the voicemail, and uh, the the voice on the other end says, uh, "Gary, this is Ethel Kennedy. Uh, I've got great news. Give me a call." And she gives me her phone number. And then as she's hanging it up, she doesn't get. The, the, she doesn't get it all the way down. So it doesn't actually hang up. You know, she, I can hear the phone kind of rattle. And then I, I hear her in the background, you know, muffled voice. I can't hear what she's saying, but she, so I can't call her back. So when I tried to call her back, I get busy signal forever, you know, hour after hour. And I'm, so I told my editor, I think I just won the Robert F. Kennedy <laughs> journalism award for editorial cartooning, but I'm not sure because I can't get a hold of her. So uh, I called the org. I called the organization that ran the contest and I asked them, you know, I told them, I said, she didn't get the phone hung up and I can't call her back. And so they gave me her personal assistant and she gave me a phone number to call, but she says, don't call until nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Don't call before then. So I had to wait till the next day and at nine o'clock in the morning, I called her and she sure enough told me that I won. And, you know, she was inviting me to come to the Kennedy Center in D.C. and receive the award. And and she was there and I got to meet her and that was pretty cool. Now, and now, the, the same that? at this, the same year that I won, so did Dan Rather. And I got my picture taken with Dan Rather and we're both holding these awards. And uh, Dan didn't know he didn't know me, but <laughs> when. When he left uh, his network, I did a cartoon. What very flattering of him, but he didn't know. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of those Uber fans or Uber stars are like, you know, they're in their own their own world. And that's why I like about you. You're very approachable. So, and you're, you know, a hometown hometown sort of guy. So, uh, well, Gary, I've I've really enjoyed this. I we could probably talk for Thanks. hours, and I I sure definitely want to connect with your Bible study. And uh, right, I'm, right. I'm interested in that. And I love your work. And uh, hey, you never know, I might run for some other political office and you can draw a funny cartoon <laughs> about it. You know, okay, I certainly and, will. And all Home that improvement stuff. too, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, we, you know, there's some improvements that need to be happening because it's, uh, it's been very, 
Very interesting. Uh, I, I say it, it took Bill Hudnut 20 years to build up the city and the last administration just four years to destroy it. So <laughs> that's my political <laughs> statement for the for the day. That'll probably okay. be enough. Uh, John, so you, I appreciate you should, it. You should, have been a, you should have been an editorial cartoonist, John. Yeah, well, I do tell bad dad jokes, so that's that's probably close as it <laughs> it could get. So yeah, yeah if, you, if you if you ever run need an idea, I probably could give you one to, <laughs> if you need it. So well, I see that Vern Vern Nelson, Vern Nelson says I'm a normal guy. I'm glad I'm not abnormal. That would be not good. But uh. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I say normal's boring. I really do. I mean, that's what makes the world go around. You know, it's like we're all part of the you know body of Christ, and we need to all each get out there and build the kingdom. Absolutely. And uh, if we can get that done, then I, hey, the world be a lot, lot better place. We got to be so. Salt and light. If you really want to talk, uh, we'll get you on the mouthwash. Uh, so, one quick more question: What would be your uh, probably, I guess, not favorite political topic, or what would be your most uh, uh, one you're most passionate about? What's the the biggest thing? I know you talked about the debt a little bit, and this and that, but. Uh, uh, you know, I, I have drawn a lot of cartoons about the debt. I mean, it took us 43 presidents to get to $5 trillion in debt. And, uh, and then in eight years, Bush took us from five to 10 trillion. And then uh, Obama took us from 10 trillion to almost $20 trillion in debt. And uh, this last administration went from 20 to $28 trillion. I mean, it, it's insane. It's not sustainable. We can't continue doing that. And then nobody, I, as far as I know, no one in Washington's that concerned about just printing money. Uh, I, I see big red flags, but, and, but it, it you know, like the, especially right now we've spent, we just, they just passed a $1.9 trillion bill and uh, proposing another $2 trillion bill. I think there's another $4 trillion bill down the road that they want to, it, it's, it's not sustainable. I mean, you couldn't run a business that way, John. You can't run your business that way. You just can't spend more money than ever comes in. Well, if they let me print money, I could do pretty good. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but then uh, well, you go to jail. They go. Yeah, they, they, they put uh, you in jail for that, that. But they get away I, with it. Yeah, there's there's that. I mean, maybe we could make our own. Maybe Gary Varvel needs to make up his own comic strip money. You know, like got Bitcoin, you could make up comic money. Yeah, you yeah, could that's, just, that's funny. Start just cranking it out. Well, then we'll so have to. Tim. Ask, Tim Tim Nardoni says that uh, Rand Paul is the only person that, that's talking about it. I think that's probably true. Just yeah. Me, well, those out and, uh, yeah, yeah. I well, and you know, it's almost like it's so ludicrous now on how much it is. It's like, oh, who cares? You know, I, I and mean, we used to have some conversation. Now it's like, oh, well, you know, I John, you, well, I, use the, I use this illustration when I talk a lot of times when I go out in public. Is that uh, people don't know how much a trillion dollars is? They don't have a clue. So, I, I, so, so here's, here's a little bit of an illustration for you. Uh, if you were to spend $1 million every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, every day since the time that Jesus was born until now, you will not have spent $1 trillion yet. You would have spent a little over $720 billion to have a way to go to get one. And we are, we're approaching $30 trillion in debt. This is insane kind of money. And yeah, just you know, what, is big what ha yeah, what happens when the interest is more than whatever the the tax revenue is? I mean, we're going to get to that point eventually. We keep going this way, uh, and then the oh, value man. of the dollar is going to just drop like a stone. But I guess we're all going to go to a global economy. So what difference does it make, right? <laughs> I'm going to store up my food. That's what I'm going to store. <laughs> yeah, food's going to be. You can't to... eat a dollar. You can't eat the dollar. Right. And I, you know, eat the salt. That's on true. That's so I, I'm going to say when we talk about the debt, we'll, we'll have you on the mouthwash show and then you can really, you know. Oh, you, you know, hey, me. put up put up what Adam Harvey just said there. And Adam is uh, a great guy. But uh, and I know Adam, but uh, he's another big issue is the Holocaust of abortion. That is another thing I've drawn a lot about over the years. A 63, this is a 62 or 63 million babies have been aborted since 1973. I think it's 62 million. That is, uh, that staggering. is a Holocaust. It is staggering. It is, it is it, unfathomable. And when you when you see these people uh, who are living today who survived an abortion, and you realize uh, what what are you doing? And science makes it very clear that these are human beings from the very from from conception. 
Uh, it, it is, it's outrageous. And here's my concern. You know, Thomas Jefferson said that he fears when he thinks that God is just and his justice will not be silent forever. And that's on the Jefferson Memorial. He said that. Well, that's my concern too. You know, there's a point where God says that's enough. You know, I've given you time to stop this, and you haven't. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it for you. And uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, but you know, I, I'm surprised it hadn't happened before. Now, God's patience is is long. It, yeah, it is. Uh, but it's not. It's not never ending. At some point, he says that's enough. And all you have to do is read the Old Testament, and you'll see that there are points where he says their sin has reached the heaven. And then he brings judgment upon. Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, there's just time and time again worship of all these different things that run amok. And like like you said earlier, it's like a lot of stuff happened a long, long, long time ago, but it, it just seems to fall on deaf ears. It's like how many warnings do you need to have? So, uh, but at the, but that doesn't that you know those of us who know the truth, we have to continue to speak out. And that doesn't give us a pass and say, well, you know, it's too big for us. I think we have to. Uh, we have to start local and we have to be salt and light the best we can. And cancel. Go uh, wow. We, we're, we're just starting a whole nother show uh, here on this. Well, I'll tell you what. Cancel culture. So hey, one, one thing, one, one, one quick thing. She, so he asked me about cancel culture and I've written about that. And uh, the cancel culture is nothing new. Uh, and you know, it was, if you read the gospels, you'll see that they were trying over and over again to cancel Jesus and finally killed him. Uh, and I read a, a great column by Lori Borgman just this week. She wrote about uh, the time when these uh, guys in Jerusalem brought a woman caught in, abor in, in adultery and then, you know, asked Jesus, you know, she should be stoned to death because that's what the law says. So what do you say? And he just knelt down and started writing in the dirt. Now, we don't know what he wrote in the dirt, but I, re I bet he was writing their sins in dirt. I'm and, thinking that too. And that's then he, and then he looked up. Eight? I but, believe that's John 8, isn't it? But then he looks up to them and says, uh, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And they all walked away. That is the difference where we are right now. In, in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I believe it is, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul writes this, in the last days men will be like, and then he gives you a big long list. And in that list, he, he includes that they will be unloving and unforgiving and disobedient to parents and uh, abusive to parents. And that's exactly what we're witnessing today. We're seeing people who are unloving and unforgiving. Uh, the cancel culture has become a religion, and there is no atonement in this religion. So if you mess up, and they don't see themselves as being sinners. See, the thing is, uh, Christianity sees that we've been forgiven for our sins. And so, you know, when we see other people who are sinful or are acting out in sin, then we recognize that, okay, that could have been me too, you know, and I have been forgiven from that. I have to forgive them for Christ's sake. That's what the Bible says. So there is forgiveness in Christianity, but in cancel culture, there's not forgiveness. And so oh, and I'm not a big fan. And I, and I, I re I resist uh, I resist it. They can come after me if they want, but I am not going to apologize for what I'm drawing. You know, uh, if you want to make something out of it, I just uh, I don't listen to those people. Now I'm used to I'm been a guy who's been used to criticism, and I've got it all my career. Um, I but you have to, hard. but you oh, but no. you have to you have to know how to take it. I don't take myself that seriously. You know, I can't believe that people get so upset about a cartoon, but you know sometimes they do. But my favorite story is about a guy uh, in, from Chicago. I don't know him, but he, he sent me an email and just listed his name in Chicago. But he said, uh, you should be ashamed of yourself. You obviously don't know what you're doing. Your cartoon today was terrible. <laughs> so I wrote him back and I said, obviously, you haven't been paying close, close attention because I've drawn a lot worse than this. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah it, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an art major from Ball State. I get graphic design. And uh, I remember we'd have critiques and I, our professor's job was to make us cry. I mean, it was just, you could have the best project going and, and they would, they would just shatter your, you know, break your spirit on things. So yeah, art critics sometimes can be uh, tough. Now, you know, the public, yeah, there's, you know, it does seem 
seem to have that. But one of the things that sticks out to me that scripture talks about right will be wrong and wrong will be right. And I see a lot of yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's Isaiah 5. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5 says that uh, woe to those people who say, uh, who say evil is good and good is evil. And that's yeah. where we are. Uh, we are saying that good is evil and evil is good. In fact, there was a column in USA Today this past week. It said that uh, Oral Roberts didn't, they shouldn't be playing basketball. They shouldn't be allowed to play basketball because their school stands for traditional marriage. They say that there's only two genders. And see what I'm saying? Because yeah. they oh, have yeah. biblical it, standards. And here's the thing that she didn't say in the, in the article, but every Christian school should have that standard. You know, every church should have that standard. Uh, and so her problem is not Oral Roberts. Her problem is the Bible, right? And so she really wants to cancel the Bible. Now, she has since lost her job, but it wasn't about that column. They didn't apologize about that column. She said something in a tweet that got her in trouble, and I, won't, I don't want to give her any more time. But I think it's interesting <laughs> what Doug Wilson just said here, if you see what Doug Wilson said. Yeah, there you go. Is yeah. that the one? Yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the thing is today, if you did survive an abortion, they would murder you after, after you're out of the womb. That is yeah. the problem. I mean, that is infanticide. In fact, it's all infanticide. Um, but we live in uh, evil times. Yeah, it, it, and when they pass an abortion law and they get up and cheer about it, you know, it, that. Oh, that really, that's what they did in New York. <laughs> yep. ah, yeah. Yeah. And, I, it, it, and you know, it breaks the heart of God, too. Um, yeah. You know, in, the, in I, Ecclesiastes, it talks about even the stillborn baby that didn't see any sin, you know, basically goes straight to heaven. But, uh, you know, what about the people that are involved in this? What about the burden of the woman that has to deal with that? And, and I don't know how you could be a, a doctor to do this. I don't. To me, the the whole thing is is uh, I just don't know how I don't know how you could justify it. So uh, it sounds well, like yeah. we could get you on the uh, the uh, the show if we want to cover that one. That 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 hot potato subject is is a very very tough one, uh, and a lot I, of people I would want to really heated. I would want to say this that there is forgiveness at the cross. So even if somebody has, uh, you know, performed an abortion or had an abortion, uh, there is forgiveness. And, uh, you know, so Christ died for that as well. And so I, I would not want anybody to, to feel like I'm um, condemning them because that, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm saying is that the practice of that, it, we need to stop it. We need to uh, um, be concerned about the innocent life in the womb. Uh, it th the thing is, if you have a biblical worldview, uh, then you understand that God created us in His image, and our value is because He's put value on us. But if you take the attitude that we're all a bunch of products of evolution, which, by the way, I don't have enough I don't have enough faith to believe in evolution. I'm sorry, I don't. I, it, and people say, no, it's not faith, it's science. No, it's, it's faith. You're asking me to believe in explanation. And then trillions and zillions of miracles have to take place in order for life to come to be. And that you're telling me that one uh, species trans transitioned to another species and there's no evidence of that. That's uh, too big for me. I believe in one miracle. God always existed. Everything else is explained. He's wise beyond belief, and he knows how to create everything. Science is catching up, and they're discovering things. And one of my, one of uh, one of the things I think is fascinating is like DNA and RNA. They have to coexist together. You can't have one without the other. Life doesn't work. Uh, RNA reads the DNA. I think RNA RNA creates the proteins that keep them alive. Anyway, so the question is, which came first? They both had to be created at the same time. And so they can't just create themselves. I mean, you, I mean, you have to think about this. Nothing that we understand in life just happens by itself. It's like, you know, looking at one of my cartoons and saying, well, that evolved over time. There was no cartoonist. It, it's insane. It doesn't make any sense. 
Uh, yeah, and, and that is uh, that is true. And I, I say stuff about evolution that if we if we came from apes, then why are there not other apes that turn into people? I just exactly. you know, and, and and I don't know if I don't remember see it continuing, right? Yeah, I don't know if you remember this when we were in grade school uh, somewhere. They said everything evolved from blue green green algae. That was the first thing on the earth, and everything is is evolved from blue green. And I want to go back and smack my science teacher. I'm like that just that, that I can't believe that you made me write that down on a test <laughs> because <laughs> I just, I'm like, okay, but Hey, the, the bottom line is who was there? I wasn't there. Were you there? I, I wasn't there. No, so, no. you know, it's, it's a very interesting discussion. Uh, when you start and, talking and that, about and that, and that, and what you just said, and that is what, uh, God says to Job in the book of Job at the end of the book of Job, where were you when I created all these things? Um, uh, Darwin himself said there was, would have been, infinite transitions. The problem is you don't see any transition today. You see changes within a species, but you don't ever see a species changing to another species. And that's, see, that's the, the hang up. But they have, you know, when I was, John, when you and I were in school, it was taught as a theory, but it's yeah. not taught as a theory today. It's taught as a fact. They can't back it up. There's no, it, it's not science. Uh, science, you got to have evidence. You got to have be able to, you know, replicate it. And there's nothing. It, it's just a, a theory that has been talked about so often that it now every, everybody just takes it as a fact. But it's not. It's not truthful. You know. And so, yeah, I can't prove. I cannot prove God. I I have a lot of evidence. Well, then it would be faith. If, if you know, that's right. my thing. If, if you know, if you had all the answers. Then you, right. we just all go straight to the, you know, we have to have so, a purpose. That's my biggest thing. We got a purpose. What's but our I purpose? do, I do walk by faith, but I, there's a lot of evidence. I, I don't think the evidence is undeniable that you know that just life in general had to come from something. The the DNA, the the information that's in DNA, and it's so tiny uh, that can't be explained as just happening. Now I can't explain where God came from. I mean, the Bible says he's eternal from eternity past to eternity pre uh, future, but I can't explain that. I don't know. But uh, to me, that I'm, it's easier for me to, to grasp that than to believe that there was nothing. And then there was an explosion for some bizarre reason, and that you get order out of disorder. That I don't, ha it seems Im impossible. Yeah. Pascal's <laughs> wager. Yeah, uh, the you know what Pascal's wager, Pascal's wager is that, you know, okay, let's say if I'm wrong and I've believed this my whole life, I lose nothing. But if a person goes through their life denying that there is a God and they die and they're, they're wrong, well, they've lost it all. For all eternity, they've lost it all. Uh, yeah, and, and I don't, I'm not a, a Pascal's wager. I'm like, I think you got to do more than just sort of believe because, you know, not, I think that there's, you know, one of the one of my favorite verses is those will have eyes will see and those that have ears and hear. And I and some people some people get it. Some people don't. And, you know, it's it's like the old uh, ACDC and Led Zeppelin. There's a stairway to heaven and a highway to hell. It's uh, you know, it's yeah, yeah. it's a, a narrow gate uh, in, a, in a wide road right. to destruction. So a little Matthew 7, 11. <laughs> so and, the, but, and we also you know have to remember, too, that the. Uh, Satan is blinding the eyes of those who are perishing. See, he wants to he wants them to lose. He doesn't want them to understand. So he blinds their eyes so they can't see the truth. Uh, and so we have to pray for those people. They're not beyond hope. As long as they're breathing, there's hope uh, that right. they will, their eyes will be opened. <clears throat> and we have to pray for God to open their eyes. Hope. Well, I'll tell you what, if you were tuning in to talk about cartoons tonight, uh, that was, I was hoping that we would talk about, you know, I, get to know Gary Varvel and what you're about. I mean, we can see the cartoons every day and and yeah. now people know where your thoughts come from, where your, what your mindset is. And I think that does help us understand your cartoons better. So uh, I, you know, like I said, you're probably going on the record time for do something indie uh, mm -hmm. as far as being on the show. So, you know, you're going to have that record. That's going to be better than that Kennedy thing you want. I mean, uh, you, don't get, <laughs> you, know, you don't get anything for it. Sorry, I'm kind of Kennedy on the I'm phone got, again for you. <laughs> sorry, I'm running off at the mouth here. I, I, no, I, I apologize. I, 
I know. I love it. I love it. You've spent this yeah. much time with us and, uh, this has been a very good conversation and, uh, I, you know, I look forward to it, and I definitely want to get you on our mouthwash show so you can work over the Gen Zs and the and the millennial on there, <laughs> and uh, we'll okay. we'll get it going. So, Gary, I do appreciate you stopping Thanks, in to John. do something, Indy, and uh, you know, keep on drawing, baby. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, have a good night. All right, see you.